Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this special event, the celebration of the music of Melba Liston and Randy Weston, and we're kicking it off with this pre-concert talk, and we have some really wonderful guests here. Um, Sally Plaxons, the author of American Women in Jazz. Janice Robinson is also a trombonist and jazz musician. Jeff Bradfield is from Chicago. He's a music educator and also a jazz saxophonist who unearthed some of the scores that will be played at the concert tonight. And Melba Joyce is a wonderful singer and all and was named for Melba Liston, but I don't know that story and maybe she'll have time to tell us at the end. So we're gonna get started um, with Sally and then we're gonna go down the line here and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, but I know everyone is also gonna wanna get to the concerts and get to their seats, which is right down the hall. So shall we begin? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm really, really honored and happy to be here. I had the privilege of meeting Melba in the late well, well, the late 70s, early 80s, when I was working on American Women in Jazz. And in the mid-80s, I produced a series of radio documentaries for NPR, um, profiling f six jazz women. And Melba was the very first one that we chose to do for obvious reasons, that she was so important. And what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> in order to bring Melba's voice into this tonight. I, I brought some excerpts from that show. Uh, Rhonda Hamilton from BGO was the narrator, and we're gonna be hearing Melba, we're gonna be hearing Melba's mother, um, maybe a moment of Dizzy Gillespie if we can, and I'm just gonna start so you can hear Melba. Um, this is Melba talking about <clears throat> the music that she heard growing up. Melba grew up hearing church songs and folk music and the great swing music of the day. My grandpa loved Cab Calloway and, and uh, my uncle loved Lunsford and my aunties loved Basie and things like that. So we were listening to it and our ears were attuned to uh, that type of thing. We used to make so much noise that the neighbors wanted to run us out of the neighborhood. My grandma would be beating on pots and pans, and we just music, music, music. And no one was a musician. I was the only one who came along later and decided to stick with it. Is the volume on that okay? Okay, great. So next, Melba's seven years old, and they're forming a band in her school, and she comes home and asks her mother if she can be in the band. So her mother takes her to Jenkins Music Store in Kansas City and buys her a two-foot-long trombone. The next day, they bring it to school. So anyway, we went to school the next day to see what the teacher thought about it, and he said it was fine. He wasn't uh, so sure she could blow a trombone he said, I'd have her blow into it and see if she can fill it. So she picks the horn up and she said, whoa. And he was so excited about it. He didn't know what to say. <laughs> so that was the beginning of her trombone adventure. That was Melba's mother, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so then, but then we talked to Melba about how she first started learning music. And here's, here's what she said about while she was still in Kansas City and had just gotten a trombone. I found me some scales and things and and learned how to play those deep rivers and the hymns, the church songs and you know, anything that I knew, you know, that I could sing, I could find it on my horn. So I was playing, I played on radio and played at the churches in the YWCA's and things before I left Kansas City, but without the benefit of a teacher. I didn't get to teach until California. So they moved to, to Los Angeles and there Melba met Mrs. Alma Hightower, who was a, is, a, is a legendary teacher, musician, dancer in LA. And she was teaching um, as part of a WPA project um, 
at that point in the 1930s. It was in a playground, the Ross Snyder playground, and Melba became part of that group, and here's what she said about Mrs. Hightower and what they did with her. All summer long, we played in parking lots, at openings of new markets, we played in churches, we played at funerals. Ms. Hightower made us do everything. She was a friend of Bert Williams. That's how far she goes back. We had to uh, put our horns down and go and do straight man and comedy routines. We had to dance, we had to sing, we had to uh, memorize poetry from Paul Ars Dunbar. I love that quote because she's really showing like the, the inter interconnections and how deep her roots are by going back to learning all of that, those uh, poems and, and pieces of work from s earlier on. Um, th then we talked obviously about being a woman in jazz, being an African American woman in jazz, although Melba considered herself a musician before anything else. Um, and here's what she said about the options in, at that point. But as Melba recalls, options in the music world were limited during those years. In the 30s and early 40s, blacks didn't look forward to a musical career, especially a female. I and mean, female white didn't even look forward to it too tough, you know. But I wasn't no like Paul Robeson or nobody. I was not no one of those fighters and things. I didn't even know about life at all. The music that I gravitated to was what was available to me, what I was listening to, the little parties and dances and the records and things like that. You know, that seemed to be a possibility. And she was, of course, known as an arranger, a composer. Um, she was working with Gerald Wilson, Dizzy Gillespie, Quincy Jones. Um, but here's something interesting that she said about why she didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily drawn to becoming a, a superstar soloist. What she was saying in that, in that comment was that um, she was always with pencil and paper. She always wanted to be writing. But one of the reasons that she didn't want to do solos that much was because she felt that she was often, on occasion, threatened on the bandstand by some of the male musicians who were jealous because she said um, she actually had to run off the bandstand a couple of times. So she said uh, she wasn't, wasn't anxious to do that and that she still wasn't. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting insight into you know, looking a little bit deeper into why we, we think of her m more as an arranger composer. Um, so we have Dizzy on here saying that Melba was extremely helpful to other musicians. Um, she talked about learning a lot about bebop from uh, one of the musicians in Dizzy's band because she said she didn't really get it at all. And he came and found her in her room in the Braddock Hotel and said, I thought you'd be up here. And he explained what was going on with, with bebop. And um, she was equally helpful to, to many musicians. Dizzy talked about her helping um, Oh, now I can't, I can't remember who it was, but a couple of a couple of guys in the band that came to Melba, she was more harmonically advanced than they were. There are two clips of Melba starting the African American <laughs> division of the Jamaica School of Music. She spent about seven years down there, and she talked about how difficult it was because she had no support within the organization. And then she went on to describe what she did because she said, "I'm a fighter. I'm not. I would not give up." And I brought my little cassette and I brought my books and I brought music paper and um, she said when you have to do something like that you just start from the beginning and you just do it and by the time she left she said the kids knew all kinds of things and what she said was they could they could give you a good musical argument when she was finished and um, that was great and then the very last clip I have which we're not hearing is Melba at Jazzmobile talking about, teaching actually a class, and talking about being there to really pass the music on. And she said, if we're, if we're not passing it on, what are we here for? And that 
basically the rest of her life she would spend, you know, any, anywhere she could grab kids and say, here, count this, count that, do this, do that. That's what she was going to be devoted to. And that's, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Janice Robinson actually had the opportunity to play with Melba in the band that she started in the late 70s and went through the 80s called Melba Liston and Company. And Janice is a fellow trombone person. So, and a um, Manhattan School of Music. And a Manhattan Melba. School of Music. All right. <laughs> uh, I uh, started playing the trombone as a teenager. And I always say I was kind of ushered into playing the trombone because I was very reluctant to play such an awkward instrument that women were not known to play. Uh, I think there was one girl in my high school band who played the trombone. And um, I just wanted to be a trumpet player and I want everybody to leave me alone. I showed up at my trumpet lesson and there was a trombone there and they said, oh, try it, buzz the mouthpiece. And I convinced my mother that I could play this instrument. I uh, just sort of went along with it. I got in junior high school. I was in the junior high school bands. I took my lessons. I did what everybody said. And I was always threatening them that things don't turn out. I'm going back to the trumpet. So I played the trombone for about two years. I tried out for the Ted Mac Amateur Hour. Things were looking really good. I started to play little solos. We had a little jazz band. And of course, every time I met a, a professional, another music teacher. They would say, Melba Liston, have you ever heard of Melba Liston? So I've been hearing about Melba Liston since I was about 13 years old. And you can imagine the anxiety that had built up as I learned about Melba Liston. I didn't hear her play. I hadn't heard her music. Our music store didn't carry anything that she had performed on. My parents were just dreading the whole thing. They didn't want to have anything to do with this budding musician in their household. They just wanted to go to church and follow the rules and be a good girl. Um, so you can imagine um, the anxiety that built up to the place where I finally met Melba Liston. Um, I came to New I went uh, through high school in, uh, out in Clareton, Pennsylvania, and uh, then the um, Eastman School of Music for four years. And all of this time, I'm hearing, hearing have you ever heard of Melba Liston? I mean, don't you know about Melba Liston? So I'm doing a little more reading, a little more research. All these articles are starting to come out about women in jazz and um, in New York. And it's about 1974, maybe. I think before she went to Jamaica, uh, we met briefly. Uh, Clark Terry was giving a concert um, in Midtown, and there we were talking about, talking shop, just talking about trombones. In the con on the floor, in the con I mean, on the ground, the concrete, I had my instrument. I don't think I was playing. I, don't, I think she had just come to visit, and we just talked shop for a minute, and all these people around. We just talked about what, are, what horn you playing, what mouthpiece you use, and that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's, and then uh, she went to Jamaica for a few years, and... Um, came back, I think, to do some Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Dizzy Gillespie alumni concert at Carnegie Hall. And, uh, and then we, we um, uh, she called me to play in Melba Liston and Company. That was around 1979. She called me. And uh, it's one of the few times that the leader of a band has called me. Usually it's uh, the contractor or the assistant. So that, that I was really honored and very excited about playing with Melba Liston and company. She told me it was going to be an all-girl band. And we rehearsed. And it was very serious. She was very serious. She was dedicated to her music, no matter what was going on. Um, uh, I had I was I was able to view her uh, in friendship with Mary Lou Williams, who came to one of the rehearsals to view the band. Um, and during that time, I don't remember one comment that Melba. I, I remember one comment, only one comment that Melba gave me. Now I don't know what she said to other people, but I remember one comment that she gave me while in that band, and it was a very uh, delicate subject of articulation. If I could just for one one. Uh, just quickly, because Melba was all ears. She was hearing everything, everything that was going on. And, uh, you know, I had, I had studied a legato style of tonguing, which helps make the, make the line very smooth. 
Well, I use this uh, legato tonguing. You know, it's very subtle. Most people cannot really hear what's going on when a, when legato tongue is moved uh, is used well. And Melba looked at me and she said. I want it slurred, natural slur. She looked right at me, and she, <laughs> I mean, in the middle of the band, I think that we had seven people, you imagine, with drums and bass and everything. Uh, so that, that was one of the comments. And I, I, I kind of um, think about her now as a kind of liberal mother wit, because uh, we were aware of each other. Um, she made very uh, supportive comments. She never demanded that I do anything. As a matter of fact, um, it was more don't follow me, do your thing. Don't follow me, do your thing. You are yourself. I got that feeling. And, and it was always sort of like that even when uh, um, I saw her in the Dizzy Gillespie Dream Band, we recorded together um, for, was it PBS? I think it was a PBS special. I was the last minute substitute for Slide Hampton. And the band, and it was Curtis Fuller and Benny Powell and Melba. And they were very supportive. I, I came in in the middle of a last rehearsal for a TV show. And they were very supportive, and they gave me direct and short little notes. This is what we do. We only have like an hour or so, and then we're on, you know? And uh, it, it was wonderful. And of course, I enjoyed her wonderful um, smile and just being, uh, her presence being very supportive as she um, had her health issues. I did visit her with my daughter, and it was sort of like a neighbor uh, encouraging her to you know, get into that computer and do those arrangements, and of course she did that. So it's been, a, I call it, a sort of kind of a liberal mother wit that has been around and, and is still around. It was really, really special to hear. Thank you so much. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, these beautiful slides are um, thanks to Sandy Jordan, who put, put together these slides for this presentation, and they really kind of show a range of Melba's life from when you saw when she was a teenager until later in life. It's really wonderful to have them. Thank you. Um, and Jeff Bradfield. Hello. <coughs> I'm a saxophone and saxophonist and composer. I'm from Houston originally, but I've been living in Chicago for about the last decade. And um, that has a lot to do with how I came in, in closer contact with Melville Liston's work because Melba Liston's archives, which includes all of the sheet music that she had when she passed away, her own and other people's, uh, is housed in Chicago at Columbia College at the Center for Black Music Research. And uh, I encourage any of you who are musicians or students of music that if, if you're ever passing through Chicago, or you're downtown and have a few hours off, that you make an appointment and drop by and see them. You can just walk in and see the stuff. It's amazing. Um, so I thought that I'd, I'd spend my few minutes that I have to talk to you today to tell you a, a bit about how some of the music you're going to hear tonight got from those archives to the stage and uh, give you a little bit of background on the three pieces of hers that you'll hear. I first started working with that music, with that archive, in about 2010 on a grant from the Mellon Foundation and the Black Metropolis Research Consortium, which, uh, as a working musician, just afforded me the opportunity to spend a couple months doing nothing other than looking through her music. Uh, so I just went to the archives every day, started with the stuff I was most interested in and knew the most about, and just kind of worked my way out from there. And I didn't get through all of it, because there are, I think, 54 boxes. 